All right, guys, welcome back to the Adam Peeler Fitness Podcast. On the other side of the screen, I have Mr. Brendan Tappen, who is a doctorate of physical therapy student and a pretty strong power lifter and coach in his own right. Uh, if you go onto his Instagram, Tappen Powerlifts, he has tons of these uh, really cool client testimonials of, you know, his lifters doing some pretty big things. And uh, he's able to still make strength progress in PT school and a doctorate program, which is uh, pretty impressive. But uh, I kind of, I guess I'll pass the, 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 the baton to Brendan to introduce himself a little bit more to you guys. Yeah, how's it going, guys? So I'm Brendan. Um, so I actually met Adam through a mutual friend in my PT class, um, Kevin Hamidi. So it's kind of cool that way, you know, he always told me, you know, one of my best friends, he's a power lifter and stuff. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. Oh, wow, this guy's a pretty strong guy, man. Pretty lanky, tall dude, but man, he can deadlift. it. Holy crap, you know? So then we started following each other, kind of chatting up on Instagram. You know, we'd go back and forth and, you know, here we are on this podcast. And I feel like, um, yeah, we just like, we have a lot in common, kind of similar backgrounds. Um, me and Adam both kind of, we're both taller power lifters too. So it's kind of cool. You don't really see a whole lot of like long, lanky power lifters. So it's a little different. And I will say, you know, like, everybody's different and programming for even tall people versus short people, you know, it can be a little different at times. So really cool yeah. stuff. But um, basically I've been in this game for, I've been lifting since I've been 16. So good 12 years of lifting. I haven't really been powerlifting specific for that long. I've been maybe doing that for maybe five, six years at this point. And I've always been super interested in like programming. I kind of started out um, kind of similar to Adam too, more so like, hypertrophy kind of like power bodybuilding in a sense i know adam hates that term but mm. um yeah just kind of loving the main compound lifts loving the power lifts but never really got into it until uh lane norton so kind of following lane norton you know he kind of set the tone and he was pretty much the pioneer for raw power lifting and that's kind of how i got into it you know and just kind of took off from there yeah so um brendan said something really in in interesting about we were talking about, about, about this off air before we, we came on, but there, how there are differences with programming for, for taller power lifters versus shorter power lift, lifters. Um, from my own personal observations with myself and with my uh, clients as well, as well who are taller and, you know, you know quote unquote, late lengthier, because like the reality is that a lot of the best power lifters that you do see on the platform are not that tall. They're like, they're sub six foot. Um, like Russell Orhees, five foot six. Brett Gibbs is like that same height, I, I believe. And like, and you'll always be surprised too, because like you'll see somebody on Instagram, and then when you see them in real life, you're like, wow, they're a lot shorter than I expected. Yeah, it's kind of funny how that works. Mm -hmm. and Versus like, like most of the time, I feel like when people see me online, and then they see me, they're like, holy crap, man, you're taller than I thought. Holy smokes. Well, that's what everybody says to says says to me when they actually meet me. They're like, wait, you're way taller, like like way link your build and whatnot. Um, so I, I think that like, just to, just to go into it, um, something that I've noticed, and if you guys listen to my podcast with Steve and Novi, Steve actually pointed this out, uh, like a really big, big difference with that is just volume in terms of how many sets that, that you're, you're giving your lifters. Um, because if you're taller, you're gonna have longer femurs and just longer arms and the distance traveled on every single movement is it's just going to be greater. Uh, I personally Absolutely. found that my taller lifters just they cannot survive the same amount of volume and they usually tend to be a lot more intensity sensitive um than shorter lifters and what i mean by intensity sensitive is that like one to two top sets of like above an rpe eights usually leaves them in pretty bad shape um or in, in worse like more doms more you know feeling more of that blah nervous system type of fatigue the day after Whereas my shorter lifters tend to, you know, obviously tolerate a little bit more volume, but they tend to be a little bit more uh, resilient to coming back to, you know, to intensity. Yeah, absolutely. I kind of have similar, you know, thoughts on that. I have one guy who's actually six foot seven that I coach, super tall, lanky guy. And, you know, like at first, you know, I kind of gave him a little bit too much volume and probably push him a little cover in time. And he just like, if you think about it, you know, when you have somebody who's five foot four, you know, squatting down versus someone who's six foot seven, 
you know, it's almost like one rep of the five foot four guys equal to two reps of the six foot seven guys. So it's just a longer distance. You're working with a big, long movement there. Yeah. So it's very different in that sense. And uh, yeah, I definitely agree too with like the whole intensity seems to kind of cook them out more and kind of fry them. I've definitely seen that as well. Um, me, myself, like I squat high bar, full conventional right now, and I have super long range of motion on bench. So definitely affects me the same way. And I kind of, you know, right now I'm in PT school, so I'm kind of like slow in progress, you know, undershooting everything, just kind of enjoying feeling good out there training. It's, it's kind of nice right now. Just a different pace. Yeah, I think that I think that is the the, the biggest difference. It's just the, the the pacing of the progression in terms of how like how do you ease that that lifter into the the intensity? Because you know, for powerlifting, you have to lift heavy weights and you have to be good at lifting above RP nine. You know, that's the platform. Um, and so what I what I usually do with my longer you know leverage guys and longer range of motion is basically, um, you know, and, and if you, any of you guys who's, who's is familiar with biomechanics understands the concept of moment arms and lever arms. And basically, if you have a longer uh, moment arm between yourself and the barbell, like, you know, with, with your hips, for example, you have to produce way more force per rep to actually get down. And then also, you know, with the eccentric contraction, the lowering down of the weight, that's a part of, of like muscle growth and the actual lift there's more muscle damage also involved. So that's, a, that's really why I think that you have like the bigger, like the taller guys can't do as much volume. Now, I don't want people to like hear this and say, oh, well, I'm tall, therefore I'm screwed with powerlifting. Not at all. It just means you need a different approach to your, your training. So Brendan, if you have like, for, for example, say that you have that six foot seven, seven guy versus somebody who's, you know, five foot eight, uh, what would the main difference be when programming? Um, I'd say just overall volume on the, like the main lifts, I'd say I kind of changed that. So for that tall guy, really dipping that volume down for him on the comp lifts. I will say though, a lot for a lot of my tall lifters, I'm a huge fan of like doing a ton of bodybuilding stuff for him. Just really putting on good size, especially like the one guy in, you know, for instance, right now he's like pretty slender dude. So like really, ideally I want to put a lot of muscle on his frame. So really focusing on like, you know, get those comp sense in and then right to accessory volume, really blasting it. We want to produce as much hypertrophy as possible right now. Get them big and strong and it's going to really carry over to his comp list. What about uh, with, with shorter guys? Yeah, with shorter guys. And I mean, it's like always lifter dependent too. And, you know, there's a lot of different styles out there um, as far as like long range of motion on bench. Yeah, you're not going to be able to handle quite as much volume. Um same thing for like deadlifts. I find that my sumo pullers can really handle a lot more volume, my conventional pullers and intensity as well. A lot of the times on that secondary day for sumo pullers, um, we're, we're getting after intensity pretty hard still, you know, getting after not as hard, you know, not as much as like the main primary day, but like for my conventional pullers that secondary day, like it's sandbag. Like I rarely have my conventional pullers on that secondary day going over like RP, like sub six, just super efficient movement pattern. Um, just, you know, getting some pra more practice in on that secondary day, but yeah, ideally I don't want to cook them out. I want to save it for that big primary day and let them, you know, knock out that top set. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that, um, so I, first off, like I, I completely agree, uh, with, with all that. I think that hypertrophy is a really underutilized tool with a lot of power lifters who are new to this sport because they'll be looking at the top guys and seeing, oh, they're super competition specific, like Ashton, Rubuska, and that's a big mistake because the reality is that you're probably not Ashton, Rubuska. You're probably not that like, as muscular as you could be um, because, and Greg Knuckles has done a really good job vocalizing this, is that the real difference between bodybuilding and powerlifting training is in it really just when you approach competition more or less, and then obviously in, in your off season Definitely. rocks, you will be a little bit less competition specific. So you're doing less, you know, of your volume slot, I guess, towards the competition lift and probably doing some other movement patterns that are a little bit more efficient at hypertrophy. And obviously this is going to be dependent upon le leverage. It's like, for example, because I have such a long range of motion on bench press, it's not very efficient. I find bench press just to be what I need mostly to just grow my chest. Whereas somebody who has a very big arch 
you know, they're going to need to do lots more dumbbell pressing and stuff like that with a longer range of motion. Um, and Absolutely. Then, like somebody who wants to actually grow their legs, but they have leverages like me and, you know, weaker quads, stronger hips and posterior chain. You probably don't want to do squats for much more than just strength skill practice for them. And then do a lot of your volume slots and hypertrophy with, you know, leg press, with lunges, with other, you know, less fatiguing movement patterns that will simulate that target muscle a little bit more. Um, and then as you approach competition, then, you know, you, you spend more of your time actually doing that strength skill practice because you're, it, it's just like, it's basic periodization for sport training in general. Your specificity increases as competition increases. Definitely. And yeah, like, honestly, like Adam was saying about like the leg presses and, you know, the hack squats and stuff like that, the dumbbell presses, like fall in love with those movements, all those movements, like they're super enjoyable to train, especially if you come from like a bodybuilding background. Heck, actually, I like uh, when I get a, a new client and they come from like a bodybuilding background, I'm pumped. I'm like, awesome. You know, like, you know, they're going to really get after their accessories. They're going to be, you know, ready to pump out some volume. We're going to get them to that peak level, you know, and really, you know, honing on the skill of like comp movements, you know, still getting practice with those a lot, you know, high frequency. I'm, I'm big on like frequency for all those lifts, for the main lifts. But yeah, that's what I love after, you know, the comp lifts and I don't have to blast them with a ton of comp sets. I'll save some stuff, especially deep in the off season, you know, get right to the bodybuilding stuff, fall in love with, you know, leg press, hack squat, you know, your bodybuilding accessory stuff and get after those and push those, you know. Don't just go in and, you know, do, oh, you know, I'll throw, you know, two, three plates on the leg press. Hey, I'll do my 12 reps. No, like get after it, you know, get up to like seven, eight plates eventually, you know, over time, slow progress. But what I find for myself too, and I kind of come from that bodybuilding background too, um, my powerlifting and just my, my heavy singles and just my peak level of strength is always better when I'm blasting, you know, my accessories. And I, whenever I have some form of progression in there for my accessories, like, all my complex just thrive whenever I have that in here. Absolutely. I've noticed that, that too. Um, for example, with, with this, with this block, um, you know, I've been doing a lot more of like belt squat, for, for example. And like, I start off my, my, my training cycle with like, you know, just doing like three plates per side for like, you know, sets of, of uh, 12 and now I'm moving my way up just to six plates per side and my squat has followed suit. And I think that, so, what I actually do with, with, with programming, I have a video all on this on my YouTube, YouTube channel and an article that literally shows kind of how I, I program it. Um, in the off-season, more volume-focused blocks, which is the off-season block, um, where the goals are to build more muscle, increase work capacity, because the reason I think a lot of, and I also want you to define that too, because people don't understand what work capacity means and why it's important for a power lifter. It's not just, you can do sets on sets on sets. It, like that is a part of it, but if you can do more volume and recover from that, when you go into an, in the intensity part of your training and you're peaking for competition, um, you're going to have better recovery in between sessions and have better ability to adapt to that training stimulus. Um, so that's why you, you know, that's what work capacity means. And then the third is just going to be um, loop pattern variability, just because people it's it's really boring just doing nothing but squat bench and deadlift a lot of the other times and not only that there are other considerations with um and brendan can, can talk a little bit more about this too with his uh, pt background but counting on those same movement patterns with a lot of high frequency high intensity high volumes is going to be more of a stress on your tendons and your joints um, you, you know, like the same sheer stress. Now you will get you will get, get stronger over time with the specificity on that, but it can be easy to overdo it, and it makes sense to back off and have some different lines of compression on your joints and tendons. Um, but yeah, in volume blocks, I will generally have the um, and people are gonna be like RPE five to eight. Like that isn't that too too low? Is that's where I will will keep my uh, my compound set, like my, my compound lifts, squat bench and deadlift during these um, intense, I mean, these, these volume focused blocks, still train them like, like a power lift lifter, but it's gonna be much less volume on them and much less, less intensity. And then I will put on like a higher RPE in my accessories and have more of the volume go towards those accessories than the, the comp lift. And then, and then kind of put that on its head in an intensity block and do much more movement, you know, practice on the uh, comp lift and then higher intensities too. You know, maybe we're, maybe we're pushing in, in, into nine, maybe on bench press, you know, maybe, you know, a, a 10. Um, and then, 
you know, less intensity, a little bit less volume on the on the accessories. And what I kind of see with that is that it kind of really does help with with their psychology of programming of their focus during that period of, of training. Yeah, and Adam definitely brings up a good point that the lifter like psychology behind it all. I know most people think, you know, it's all physical, all physical. Like, I think the mental aspect of powerlifting is often overlooked, especially when you're training year round, you know, you're doing the same lifts over and over again, it just tends to get monotonous, you know? So that's why I do like throwing in some slight variations, you know, and kind of changing things up because, you know, it's something fresh, it's something new. And chances are the lifter is not going to have to, you know, if I'm doing low bar squat two times a week and that's all I'm doing, I'm always going to compare my numbers to, oh, you know, this baseline, this baseline, then guess what? Finally, you don't hit that. Or training's just not going as well. You're going to probably start overshooting. And then you hit that snowball effect and it all goes downhill from there, you know, and you just get in that chronic overshooting phase. And then before you know it, it's like, man, I'm, you know, you're either injured or, you know, you're just not hitting the numbers you were before. And that's super frustrating versus, you know, you start throwing in some variations. It's like, and kind of like me and Adam were talking about this too. He's currently doing uh 50 squat bars right now, safety bar squat squats. And um, he's loving it right now. Cause it's a fresh, you know, new movement. He's not constantly comparing numbers to his comp squat, you know, cause there's literally no baseline. So anything he hits is a PR. How fun is that when you're PR in every session? It's awesome. Just mentally, it's like, you know, you're on top of the world and it carries, it carries over to your next session too, you know, then he gets to his high bar day and he's like, oh man, you know, I'm crushing my squats right now. Let's go, man. Got that momentum flowing. So that's always a good feeling there. And yeah, I kind of, I've gotten to this too before, um, just programming too much comp specificity for some lifters. Um, there's one actually re recently we did a lot of low bar squats and nothing but low bar squats and squats kind of tanked over time. I mean, there's a lot of different variables in there, but it's just the monotony of it all versus, you know, throwing in a high bar squat for a secondary day or throwing in, you know, SSB or pause squats, even tempo squats, you know, it's just different and it kind of changes the pace a little bit. It's a different stimulus, and, you know, it kind of makes training fresh and enjoyable. When you're training year round, you know, like most power lifters do, you got to enjoy your training. You can't just go in there. Oh, you know, I'm doing the same movement again. It's just, you're going to burn out. But yeah, overuse kind of like Adam was touching on there too. When you're doing the same movement over and over again, obviously like periodization, just, you know, phase potentiating everything that's going to be, you know, kind of King, like just cause you're training a movement over and over again, doesn't mean you're going to necessarily get out, you know, injured as long as you're periodizing, you know, taking your deloads as needed but yeah like that's something to also keep in mind too you know like sometimes you can get a little more beat up just doing the same thing over and over again yeah that's also something i also wanted to talk about is, is, is just the whole concept of you know because we brendan pop brought this up in the beginning of power building and we've been talking about this having different phases of training so first off um because this is a question i get asked all the time because i'm sure that you do too like because power building is like the holy grail oh i can get bigger and i can get stronger at the same time sign me up and i can do it like like optionally because that's how how it's marketed holy crap sounds too good to be true well first off there, there there's a reason why it sounds too good to be too true but brendan why do we have distinct phases of training where you're either focusing on more volume and intensity instead of just doing both at the same time like why not like like why not just do both at the same time just kind of depends on your goals at the current time too, you know, like obviously deep in the off season, you really want to have more volume, a little more hypertrophy in there. But when you're really, you know, reaching for that peak end range strength, you're going to kind of dip down some of those accessories and just, you know, focus more on the main, you know, compound big three movements and just kind of hone in on that skill level and kind of reach to that, you know, that peak end range strength. But yeah, the one thing I feel like with the whole power building, you know, term, it's like, a lot of people, they think they can be, you know, both at the same time. Like, obviously, you got to kind of prioritize one or the other. I think they're pretty similarly related. They both kind of have their benefits for each. But, um, you know, you're not going to be the most jacked dude, probably. And then also moving the heaviest weights possible while being, you know, 6%, you know, body fat, super shredded. Like, it's probably not going to happen unless your name's Russell or he or, you know, some of those other outliers. Like, it's just, it's not going to happen. Yeah, and just going back to, um, you know, so the reason why power building is really just a suboptimal approach for really anybody who is serious about getting the best results 
is because there's a limited ability that we have to adapt to certain stimuli. And it kind of goes back to the concept of specificity and sub principle specificity, which is directed adaptation. And um, if you're trying to do high volume, you're gonna to have too high of fatigue to maximally express strength and higher, and higher repetitions, you know, that's going to interfere with your um, strength work because you're going to be, have more muscle tone from that. You're going to have more uh, systemic fatigue from those higher volumes. Um, the second, you're not going to have enough skill practice on the movement itself to actually get the best that you possibly could because there's, huge, there's a huge skill component to mastering the squat bench and deadlift that other movements that you want to have, you know, be, be strong on. Um, and just the third off from a practical standpoint, um, anything works for a short period of time, but eventually you're going to hit a really big brick wall if you're trying to do everything at the exact same time and you're not periodizing your training in any manner. Because essentially, power building is not a periodized form of, of training. And I think that's its biggest downfall. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Periodization is crucial for any sort of sport. Um, I, bodybuilding, it doesn't matter as much, but I also would, 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 would argue that you still periodize bodybuilding training. It's just in different ways um, and not as nuanced as powerlifting. But the lack of periodization in your training means that there's no direction. And that's the biggest problem because you can't, like, it, it, it just it baffles my mind for somebody to you know that people don't understand this. But at the same time, it's like, unless you actually have a background in sports, you know, science, it's hard to really understand, well, like, why can't I get both? Like, I see all these, I see these guys who are big and they're strong and they're, and they look great. Why can't I have that? Well, the reality is that you actually can have that, but it's best to like leapfrog the, 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 the phases with the phase potentiation. So like in strength phases, for example, intensity, you know, repeating for me, you should still have enough volume in there to preserve muscle mass. And probably have like some small hypertrophy stimulus. Likewise, in hypertrophy block, you should have enough top end, you know, intensity exposure to maintain that top end exposure. So what you're basically doing is you're putting one of them on the back burner. Maybe that's going at, you know, as Mike Israel would say, minimum effective volume or maintenance fall volume, while the other adaptation is being pushed to maximum adaptive volume. So yeah, that's my spiel about power building. It's it's fine if you don't care about, about getting like, the best results and you're just doing this to have, to have fun. But I tell you what, like when you when you reach a plateau and you're not progressing in the gym, it ain't much fun anymore. Not at all. Not at all. Do you have anything anything, anything to add on that uh, whole point with, with power building? Um, but yeah, going into the whole like, go ahead, Adam. Oh no, I was sorry. I think my, my signal kind of glitched for a second there. Mine did too. What were you gonna say? Uh, I just I just wanted to ask about um, like if you have any other follow up points about you know power building. Yeah, so I actually kind of started out doing that. Really, no structured program. You know, just kind of going in like, and I didn't really have any goals to be a power lifter. You know, just kind of wanted to go in there, be kind of like a gym rat, get big, get strong. Like, yeah, it's cool, but like, it's not gonna really. You know, if your goal is power lifting, you want to lift as much as possible, it's not going to get you to that goal. If you want to go in and, you know, be a bodybuilder, like it's also not going to get you towards that goal. You know, you can look good and, you know, you can have fun in the gym, but it's still like, if you're more specific, you're not going to be, you got to be a master of one. You can't really just have the best of both worlds, kind of. It's just, you know, it's all preference. So, you know, teach their own. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to totally click clickbait this podcast now with, with 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 like why why power building sucks. What to do instead? <laughs> yeah, right. Clicks, but um, yeah, I guess um, I wanted to to ask uh, Brendan then. I, I guess um, with your own training re recently, you know, during PT school and, and, and whatnot, um, just I I'm, just, I'm sure a lot of the, of the listeners, you know, are in school. You know, because I know a lot of my, my listeners are, you know, 18 to, you know, 45 years old. Um, what do you personally, like, how do you handle it? Because that's a question that I get asked a lot, um, is how do you lift weights, get stronger, get, get jacked, but also have a brain or, and are actually smart? And I, again, yeah, you know, so as far as my trainings went since beginning of PT school, I kind of knew going in, like, you know, it's probably gonna be a little different. I have to change some things up. Like I'm gonna have to, you know, 
figure out how to make it all work and how to still be able to train, you know, obviously still excel in PT school. Um, actually, one thing I did at first is I went down to three times a week training. So it's kind of like, it was just a different pace for me, you know, going in three times a week, you're going in every session, you're still rested up and it's full, you know, it's like, wow, I feel great. And I was doing a lot of SPD sessions there, you know, but it really wasn't that bad. Actually, I saw a lot of good progress, which kind of shows, you know, you don't have to be in the gym six, seven times a week. If anything, I think it's probably less than optimal to do that. Um, but yeah, just three times a week made really good progress. And one thing I kind of implemented too was, um, definitely training like a lot of low RPE stuff. Like all my back off volume was probably sub six and just for the efficiency of it all, you know, so I'm not doing four hour sessions in the gym. You know, a lot of my back off volume is all super like sub six, and, you know, still getting that heavy top set exposure in there. So that was good. And I was actually making really good progress, you know, coming in week to week, just with a ton, ton of momentum. Like I was just making big jumps week to week on my top set and it went really well, surprising. Kind of impressed. I was like, wow, I didn't expect to, you know, be able to make such good progress on three times a week. So it was kind of cool. But um, yeah, and one thing since beginning PT school too, I lost 15 to like 20 pounds. So, you know, just off that aspect, I'm like, okay, well, I'm not gonna be as strong as you know when I was 220. You know, when I'm 200, 205, like it's gonna be hard. I feel like I've got there, but it's taken me time to kind of get back to that baseline where I was at when I was 220. So, I mean, it was kind of, you know, frustrating at first team, you know, a little bit of a dip in progress and just strength levels, but it's kind of cool getting back to that strength level and it just shows, you know, like even looking back, you know, from then to now, like my skill acquisition, just my execution of all three lifts has proved a lot. So it's been, it, it was challenging, you know, like you'd have to kind of sacrifice workouts at times. Sometimes I have to push sessions back a day. You know, if I had a big exam coming up, like, you know, school came first, so. Going into PT school, I kind of knew that, you know, training is going to kind of be put on the back burner, but I feel like all in all, I'm still chipping away, still making decent progress. And ideally, once I finish PT school, I want to bulk back up, hopefully fill out the 105 kilo class, pack on about, you know, 20, 25 pounds over the course of two years, you know, try to destroy those old PRs. That's kind of the move. Yeah, I think that you, uh, that that's a really, really good um, thing for listeners to hear is that even if you can't train as much as, as you want to, you can still make great progress to make the best out of that situation. Um, I know that for myself, when I was in, in school, because for the listeners, like before COVID, I was in the middle of my master's. I was almost, I was like halfway through it actually with athletic training, you know, that took a lot of time out of my day, you know, studying for all, the, all those exams and whatnot. And, you know, there are some times when you do have to put your, uh, your schooling first because that's what you're there for. You're there, you're paying thousands of dollars to get your, your, your education on. Um, but also I think that it really comes down to setting yourself up with a training split that doesn't stress you out like crazy. Um, I was on, like with, with Aiden uh, Raider on my last podcast, because he's, he's a nursing school. He said that uh, Sean Noriega, his coach, actually structured his training around his schedule to actually make sure that he could get in all the, all the volume on days when he had some more time. And then he would just, you know, when it was school time, he would really do school and really study and study it efficiently. So like my personal biggest advice is one, be honest with yourself about what you can do, and what you can actually recover from and handle psychologically as well as physiologically um, with, 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 with training. Because if you're going into the gym, you're just mentally wiped. You're going to have a hard time squatting and benching them with him, you know. Definitely. And then also, yeah, prioritizing days of the week, you know. So, you know, if I know one day of classes is, you know, a little heavier than most, you know, probably a day off that day. If there's one day that's a little lighter, you know, probably, you know, put a decent training session on that day. And then what I was doing before, I was really saving big for the weekend sessions, you know, like having my refeed day on Fridays, you know, eating a ton of food and then going in Saturday, like feeling on fire, hitting those big top sets. And I'm still getting the heavy exposure in, you know, and that really seemed to work well. And I find with a lot of those you know, good coaches there, they can all work around almost any schedule, you know, really prioritizing you know, those, you know, those lighter days for people, you know, most people, you know, that work, you know, eight to five during the week, a lot of the, you know, clients I have, I'll program, you know, either their big squat or their big deadlift day on the weekend, because I know they're going to feel a lot more fresh on that day, you know, and they're going to probably just be more consistent week to week with, you know, a lot less external variables that can affect their training. Yes. Consistency is the number one thing, and no matter what your life circumstances, get on a program 
train a certain amount of days per week, follow that program and be consistent with it. I, I think that's just the biggest variable is I get asked so many questions like, like, what's your secret? Like, how do you do it? I'm like, I'm, I'm just consistent. I just keep showing up like on days that like, I don't want to be there, which is actually quite a few days. Like, I think that's something too, man. Like everybody thinks that like, they always have to be super motivated and like really want to train. Like, and the reality is that like, you're probably not going to feel like on fire a lot of the time. Like you're not going to feel like amazing, you know, all the time. You're going to have some secondary days or some, you know, some days where it's just is like, I feel like I got hit by a truck, but I'm still here. I'm still getting in that work. Especially um, during meat prep. Especially during meat prep. It's going to happen. It's going to hit you Absolutely. a little bit. You're going to have those days. And I know Adam, towards the end of your last prep, I know we were kind of talking to you and you were just, there were a few sessions, man. You were just feeling like you got hit by a train. Well, I did overdo my my, my bench peak. I, I saw a massive re regression as well as the, the switch to low bar um, at the last minute, which wasn't good for my shoulders and my elbows. But I I, uh, I hit like 335 in training um, and 330 multiple times. And I, you know, on the platform, I, you know, I, I couldn't, you know, I had three, 320 was, was all I, all I had, which kind of sucked, but, um, you know, it's, it's what, it's what you just, just got, got, got to deal with, but yeah, absolutely. It's just like, you know, having that stoicism and just, just walking in there and doing your job. And that's why you train with RPE anyways, you know, like RPE training works because it's literally, it's imposing the stress on your body that is appropriate. Um, and obviously you need to always like pay attention to the, the trends over time. Like if you're training with RPE, and you're hitting all of your RPEs, but you're not getting stronger. That that's not a good thing. But if you're on a good good program, your you know trends are all mostly up. But you have some days where for whatever reason you're just more beat and you can't lift as, as much weight, but you can hit you know still hit the, the hit the RPE. No bad days, man. Yeah, absolutely. And that's one thing I do find with all the RP you know structured programs. When you're doing all of the little things right, and you're kind of you know all those external variables are in check. You know your sleep, your diet, your recovery that's when you really see really good progress in those RPE programs, you know, and it just sets you up session to session. You're not going to really have bad days. You know, you're going to just keep rolling that momentum, you know, session to session. And when you got all those external variables, man, train just takes off, you know, it's just kind of, it flows. It's just so natural. And I think uh, when I did find out about RPE training, that was one of the biggest, like, kind of like turning points for my coaching too. Before I was kind of like, before I really found out about RP, I was doing more percentage base and, you know, it just does, you know, looking at it back now, it just doesn't make sense. Cause I'd have, you know, myself who's a super long arm lifter doing a bench press, you know, let's say we're doing a five by five at 80% versus somebody who's got short arms, you know, like for me, I maybe it was probably five by or four by five, whatever, five by five, 80%. It was probably an RP eight and towards the end. It was probably like 8.59 for me. And then you got that short arm bencher. And they're doing 80% for fives. And it's like, dude, it's insane. Like they could wrap it out for probably 13 reps. And it's like, man, everything's probably sub six at that point. Are they really getting that, you know, that, that exposure they should be, you know, like, geez. So it's kind of funny in that aspect, you know, and that's the biggest thing that's really changed, you know, the game for RP. I think, you know, that I is, think anybody and everybody should use it. That is such a, brilliant point happen like holy crap like what you just said there is like a sound bite like in and of itself but like <laughs> that is just that's so beautifully put because we were brandon and i were talking about this too on on, on instagram my one rep max on my squat and on my bench and on my deadlift does not linearly correlate to what i can actually hit it's always under it uh, it's always under my one rep at all and when you're going, and what'd you pull at your last meet? You pulled uh, 666 or 661. And what'd you pull at your last meet, Dadler? 661. 600 keys, baby. Um, yeah, our full by life. You have grip issues. Uh, I was holding the bar for 10 seconds on that, but um, like I the heaviest deadlift I hit for reps during prep was 575 for, for doubles or for <sighs> two. Um, and my heaviest single was 640. 575 for two is under 640 y'all and that was sub 10 like that was probably like an rpe like 9.5 um huh. and you know like using those rpe charts can sometimes really bottleneck you you can like like look, like look at them and be like 
well, okay, I should hit this. And then you like, you can't hit it or it's way more. You're either going to feel really good about yourself or like way worse. And I only, I, I encourage people, like, I don't think that, that that's a bad tool at all. Use the RP chart if you're not, if you're new to it. It's a great starting point, but don't become overly reliant upon it. Like I don't look at it at all. I just look at like, I just go off of, of RPE and how I feel. I've gotten so good at practicing it. I know what my RPEs are. Um, like it's just, and that's just something that you always have to have to, have to keep, keep in mind is just the lift for context. RPE is not the same for everybody. If you're trying to, you know, say that, you know, are you sure that was an RPE eight? Like on people like with like my squats or like deadlifts or whatever. It's like, yeah, bro. And I'm sure you get that all the time, man. All the time. Well, I know that was an RPE eight. I know that wasn't what well, that was an RPE eight. And I, how do I know that I was, re I'm really good at my at RPE? Because of my meat, the Trump selections and how I do pretty well with them. Like I know how to call my next attempt. Like for example, on well, my third deadlift attempt, I wanted to get 666 because that was the number of the beast. I was like, that sounds really cool. But I did my 640 and I said, I don't think 666 is there. So I called 300 keys and that was right on the, on the money. Same thing with squat. I wanted to do 200 kilos. 197.5 is what I called. That was the exact right RPE. And the only time I did not listen to my gut feeling was on bench press. I knew I just should have jumped, you know, five pounds. But I said, YOLO, let's do three, let's do three thirds. I hit that in the gym, even though in my gut, I knew that, that like, I maybe I really only had five more pounds. So like, anyways, like that's a, a separate rant. Don't tell other people what their RPEs are, especially their experienced lifters who are really good at judging their own RPEs. That like just, it, it doesn't do anybody any favors. It doesn't, doesn't do you any, any favors. You just come across as, as an asshole. Please stop doing it. <laughs> That's a good point, man. Um, but yeah, talking about Adam's 661 pull, I think the other day he hit a what, a 575 for three on deadlift, and that was an all-time PR. I was like, wait, what? You yep. pulled 660, and that was an all-time triple PR? Like, yep. I think the estimated one rep max for that's like maybe 620 if that was a true 10, 575 for three. I think it's like a 620-ish maybe. So it just kind of shows, you know, like, and you'll find with a lot of, you know, longer range of motion lifters a lot of the times that like true one rep max is actually going to it's going to it's going to be higher than you know whatever the estimated one rep max is based off your rep set and that's what i'll find for a lot of those long range of motion lifters yeah, so adam's you know prime yes. example of that that puts me at 625 pound estimated one yeah. rep max. that's that's crazy man which is way lower like i know based off of that i could probably i'm just just under 700 right now um, yeah so like yeah you and like you'll get like any, anyways i guess like the whole point of this and what Brandon and i are trying to get across like, i don't want to speak, speak for you but i'm also going to speak for for you is that rpe training is the way it, it really is the is the way uh especially on your primary merry days and, and whatnot train with, with your rpes get really good at it you know be, you know understand what you look like what they feel like at you know for, for your, yourself um, understand that not everybody's RP is going to look the exact same. Um, and then understand too, that like, you know, the only time I really do put in percentages is it was on like a secondary day, right? I really want to like cap it. I don't want them like doing RPE because they'll might, they might overshoot their secondary day or something like that. And I really want to say right. primary day. And that's one thing I will say, um, for that secondary day, I'm a huge fan of ascending sets and that kind of gives the lifter, you know, room to auto regulate. Oh man, you know, I hit that first set. Dang, I'm feeling on fire today i'm going to push even more and you take bigger jumps on your ascending sets and you know if anything you're coming off your probably more beat up day and you hop into ascending sets and you kind of warm up with each set and you get better set after set even adding weight to the bar so that's one thing i like i'm really huge on ascending sets and i think it's just important for you know rehab just staying healthy long term too you know mm -hmm. just really allows you to auto regulate well and, and yeah in my opinion like coming from you you know I'm really big into like PT and, you know, rehab, prehab, all that stuff. I think for powerlifting, the number one tool for staying healthy long-term, submax volume, training efficiently in the movement pattern. There's not a whole lot of different corrective exercises that are really going to do much for you, but just training efficiently, getting submax volume, and that's probably your number one prehab rehab method right there, in my opinion. Yep. Acute to chronic workload is, 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 um, also a, a big one. So for example, 
But uh, so for, for, the, for the listeners who don't know what that is, acute workload would basically be what you did in one session. And then chronic workload is what your body is used to doing. So if you did, if you're used to doing 10 sets of, uh, you know, bench press in one session, which is a lot, but this is just for the sake of example, and say you go up to like 20 all of a sudden, you're probably going to, you're probably increasing your risk of injury pretty substantially there. It's like how- Small like, jumps. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's like uh, Kevin and I were just joking about it, how like when the gyms reopened again and people just like go back to the normal training volume, it's going to be like PTs are just going to be like- money. Oh, exactly, man. Um, so yeah, like basically managing your, your volumes and not, you know, and, and also like how fast you're increasing load, like not going from a hundred pounds on one week to 200 pounds on one week. And that, that's a huge difference in volume. Uh, you know, I mean, I mean, in, in, in load on the barbell, that's also going to increase your risk of injury. And that's why lots of times, like, like Johnny Candido talks about this too, like controlling your rates of progression is really important. Um, you know, I, I add 10 pounds on my squat bench and deadlift through my, throughout my training cycle, even if I feel better on that one day, you know, it's just like, oh, I'm, I'm out pacing my program. Great. I'm still going to stick, stick to the plan. I'm bench press. I'm going to add five pounds until I peak. Okay, great. Because you yeah, just have to think long term. And, you know, if you're just making like 10 pound PR at the end of a training block on your squat, on your, you know, on your deadlift, five pound PR on your bench you have a couple eight month blocks of that boy it's huge it's going to be a problem I, 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 look at it from like a full year standpoint if you're even putting five pounds onto each lift over the course of a year every single block block to block staying healthy that's 60 pounds on each lift 60 pounds on each lift and for all three lifts that's 180 pounds to your total that's ridiculous man like if you put 180 pounds to your total every year like you're going to be one of the best, like over time. It's crazy. I mean, obviously it's not going to happen. It's, you know, you're going to kind of hit that point where you kind of flatline a little bit, you know, you're still going to be making progress, but it's not going to be as fast, but still, I mean, if you're tacking on five pounds at block to block, doing the same thing over again, if it works, why change it up? You know, that's another really good, 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 good point. Um, but I guess, um, just going back to um, like like injury management and, and prevention, like how to respond to pain in the gym and like whatnot. Um, it's basically what Brendan said. Like a lot of it is just about load management, about submaximal volume work, um, about you know managing your acute to chronic workload, um, and then not training RP nine ten all the, all the, all the time. Um, and then if you do experience pain in the gym, um, which is normal, it's fine. You're not you're not, not hugging you know, a, a teddy bear, you're lifting heavy weight. Um, you're there to challenge your, 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 your yourself. If you get a little bit of a, of a tweak or, a, or a, a niggle, that's probably all it is most of the, most of the time. Um, my best advice to, to, to that is if you do experience pain in, in the gym, take a step back, you know, if you don't feel like a, like an actual pop or like a tear and you will know if it's a pop or a tear, you say, huh, and try the, another rep. And it's a it's feeling you'll first. never forget. Yep. Yep. Yeah, we both had it. Um, oh yeah. If you if you that happens, you know, and then like, you know you do an, a, another rep, you know, and you don't you don't feel that pop or tear, just felt a little bit weird in your hip, your quad just felt a little bit off. Next rep is probably going to feel a little, a little bit a little bit better. But if it doesn't feel be feel better, take it off, take off all the weight off the barbell, do the same movement. If you can do that, great. Do, do that. I'll find the entry point uh, again, because that's what physical therapists, a good one, is going to do for you anyways. Find that entry Absolutely. point, progressively overload, then back up to the normal you know, exercise. And then also understand that the, the recovery process is not linear. You're not, it's just like training. You're not going to, some days your pain symptoms might be a little bit worse. Some days they might be really, really good. You know, it just depends. And yeah, kind of uh, expanding more onto like pain, just because you have pain doesn't mean you actually have tissue damage. So just because you have pain, it doesn't correlate to 100% having some type of like biomechanical damage. You could have pain and there could be nothing going on. Like the pain is just so complex and the body, how it responds to like stimulus, like, and just the whole biopsychosocial aspect of all, oh, I know you know about that, Adam. But, you know, there's a lot more to it than just like a biomechanical standpoint of structure, you know, something's torn, you know, there might be nothing wrong, but yet you still have pain, you know, 
So that's really cool. And yeah, going back to kind of how you're talking about, um, you know, kind of rehabbing and stuff and muscle tears and all that. Um, the way I really like to do it, I know you talked about like um, progressive, you know, having some type of progressive overload and their graded exposure. That's honestly everything, you know, what I do, you know, and I, I haven't really had knock on wood. I really haven't had any bad, you know, muscle tears or anything recently, but in the past, I tore my pack, um, hamstring tear, glute tear, uh, lat tear, pretty much everything. If you, it's kind of crazy to think about quad, but yeah, right away, as soon as I have a muscle be, tear, it's going to be your, your masseter. What's that? Masseter tear from all that shit talk you do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. None of that so far, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, man, like right away, as soon as you have that like little issue, right away as soon as i have a muscle tear i'm already moving it right away doing some like light blood flow stuff getting blood flow going kind of trying to calm down the nerves just by moving and then once you kind of get in that cycle and you know you keep movement going keep it going your nerves are going to kind of calm down stop over protecting as much and then this is why power lifters are so easy to rehab because they have such a high load tolerance already as soon as you can get back to loading it's boom just like that you're back you know and obviously it's got to be smart it's got to be you know gradual but a lot of the times you know somebody gets injured on deadlifts for instance you know back injury the next week i already have them deadlifting again whether it's a plate or two plates you know if they're a 600 pound puller that next week i'm already getting them pulling you know 135 if it's tolerable you know and then throughout the week you know constantly moving 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 is everything yep but yeah and then before you know it you know you're at one plate and the next week you do like two plates you know Obviously, what I do, too, is I tend to, like, auto-regulate. So if I give them deadlifts the next week, it's going to be on a threshold of, like, below a 2 or 3 out of 10 pain. If you can deadlift a plate, two plates, you know, under that pain threshold, perfect. We're right where we need to be. And then guess what? You get to the next week, and it's like, wow, I feel even better. Oh, I'm working up to, you know, two plates, three plates, and then next week, you know, four plates, and boom. I'm like, wow, you know, I'm already back. And I'm going throughout the day and I have no pain or anything. And it's like, it's almost like magic. And, you know, here you already got some people oh, throw ice on it. And, you know, you need to take six weeks off. I just, I, I die every time inside. Every let's, time I hear Let's that. atrophy your, all your muscles for six yeah. weeks. Yeah. You. And then it's going to be even longer. So you have the muscle damage when you get back. And, you buy, and then you're, 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 you're going to be thought that you're fragile and you're broken. And you're going to be terrified of lifting weights and moving again. And then you're going to get super sore. But, oh, yeah, I knew I, knew I, I was fragile. Yeah, it's really sad. But, guys, what Brennan has just said is basically what you'll go to a physical therapist for. And they'll charge you, you know, 200 bucks for. Um, so, and obviously, you're, if you have to do that, get help from a qualified individual, please do it. Please go to your, your sports, sports medicine provider and uh you know for more individualized help for rehabilitation but if, if you go to them and they're not giving you something that's along the lines of what we just elucidated you you should you should smell a rat and get out of there before they can charge you any more money um, definitely yeah with brendan saying about moving like another big reason why it's so important obviously that i said like the whole expectations thing with the last thing would, would be uh with, with, with blood flow um that the whole pathophysiology of it is that if you have more blood flow to the, to the tissues, there's something called cytokines and leukines in your um, bloodstream that are going to help you with phagocytosis, uh, you know, which is going to be cell eating of helping heal those uh, tissues, helping you, um, you know, just heal a little, a little bit faster um, with uh, with autophagy and all of the you know the body's processes of healing. And all that you're doing with rehabilitation, just, you know, helping that body uh, heal over time and get back to the starting spot because your body is actually really damn good at it. And I think it's really important for, for you to just, just understand, like, you are strong, like your body is strong, you're not weak, you're not injured. And even if it is just 135 pounds, you need your 600 pound puller, because guess what, I was there back in October, I could barely pull 135 without lap pain. Guess what? It's freaking awesome. Great. Here's my here's my entry point. I'm going to get back from 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 here, and you know, however long it takes, I'm going to embrace that process. Work with my body, keep that pain scale low, and create that self efficacy and that self confidence, and I'll be back to normal before we before we before I know it. 
and the body's just so adaptable too you know like it's just amazing how the body adapts to stimulus you know and it's just amazing how much it can really do it's kind of funny actually i have a story here um one of my clients we usually do like a little uh, deadlift AMRAP on Christmas Eve and I kind of peak my lifters and we'll all kind of, you know, send deadlifts, kind of a fun session. But uh, he ended up like kind of tweaking his, uh, his, his quad tendon or his patellar tendon. And I don't know why, but he, he never told me about it. And he was just keeping it, you know, low key and he's still kind of training, you know. I could kind of tell he wasn't in like best mood and stuff, you know, in the gym, I'm like, huh, you know. And squats were looking a little funky, but yeah, he never told me. And then at some point it got so bad. He's like, yeah, actually I went to urgent care. And they told me to take eight weeks off from lifting. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, I'm a physical therapist. Like I'm studying this stuff. This is my like area of expertise. Why would you go to urgent care? And I just laugh, you know, when I hear take eight weeks off, like you're not going to get anywhere, you know, based off that, you know, it's like the body needs some stimulus and you know, with that stimulus and a correct dosage of the stimulus, you're going to recover a lot faster. But it's just kind of funny to me. I'm like, man, I would never just give somebody like, don't do anything for six to eight weeks. Like, come on, like for a gym injury, come on, like just kills me. Yeah. And then sure enough, like we got him into a good rehab program and, you know, got some form of like great exposure going and, you know, got him moving throughout the day. And before you know it, I think two, three weeks later, he's like, man, I'm running pain free again. Crazy. Just like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I think you kind of beat that that horse to, the horse to, to death, but um, I think it's I think it's just really important to just talk about um, but yeah, I know I think that's basically uh you know we've been talking for about about, about an hour right now. I think we talked about a lot of really really good things. Um, so I guess I'll, I know I kind of want to wrap things up here. Uh, so I wanted to thank Brennan for being willing to you know donate his time and come and talk about this stuff. Um, uh, Brennan, uh, where people can find you uh for coaching and just to follow your 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 progression, where can they find you? Yeah, so uh, Pappin Powerlifts, P-A-P-I-N underscore uh, Powerlifts. And then also I have, I just kind of started this company too, and this is like my team. Uh, it's Momentum underscore Powerlifting. So that's kind of like my name, my team name, and just the brand name. And actually I'm planning on uh, bringing some really cool stuff out this summer. I kind of have kind of a low-key summer for school and classes, so it's going to be a little more laid back. I should have a lot more time and trying to push some content like you, Adam. So yeah, that's that's the plan, man. Awesome. Yeah, well, you know, Brandon's really, really, really qualified. Obviously, um, he has a track record of success with with power lifters and uh, what whatnot. So, if you guys are interested in coaching, definitely hit him up. Um, you know, it's always kind of fun whenever I hear coaches that are like, "Don't talk about somebody else's services." Like, the, the pool's so big. There's so many good coaches out there, and you're a, a good one. And uh, I think that if we can get more really, really good coaches, love and attention. The sport's only going to grow and get better, and uh, people are going to just be smarter, healthier, happier lifters. So, uh, absolutely, uh, yeah, it's a pleasure, Adam. Yeah, man, thanks for having me, man. For sure, man, absolute pleasure. And uh, your train's looking great, your coaching's looking great, man. Love to see it, man. Love seeing you grow. Well, I, you know, we're, we're going to end out this podcast with, with this little segment of the Mutual Admiration Society. Um, but you know, feel the same way about, about you, you, bro. Uh, so anyways, I'll shoot, put all your information in the show notes. Um, but yeah, until next week, take it easy, guys.